afternoon and welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center. I'm NASA Press Secretary Jackie McGinnis. And this morning, NASA waved off the Artemis One launch attempt after teams encountered a liquid hydrogen leak while filling propellant into the core stage of the SLS rocket. Unfortunately, the team wasn't able to troubleshoot the issue today, but to tell us more about the next steps NASA will take following the mission management team meeting this afternoon, we have with us NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Associate Administrator of the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, Jim Free, and Artemis Mission Manager, Mike Serafin. First, I'll hand it over to Senator Nelson for opening remarks. Well, while we don't have the launch that we wanted today, I can tell you that these teams know exactly what they're doing, and I'm very proud of them. Uh, you think back uh, to previous space flights. The shuttle was sent back to the vehicle assembly building 20 times. I already shared with you uh, my personal experience uh, back in the early part of the space shuttle program of uh, Hoot Gibson's crew having been strapped in, ready to go, and scrub four times with a delay of over the better part of the month. We do not launch until we think it's right. And these uh, teams have uh, labored over that, and that is the conclusion that they came to. So I look at this as a part of our space program, of which safety is the top of the list. Uh, they will tell you, uh, starting with Jim, uh, they'll tell you the specific uh, reasons why they decided to stand down and what uh, they think that the future holds. Just remember, we're not going to launch until it's right. And that is standard operating procedure and will continue to be. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon. So absolutely, I hope you know we're not where we want to be except with the vehicle safe. So we wanted it safe in orbit. It's not there, it's safe on the ground. Um, I'm gonna kinda give you the big picture of where we're headed with the launch periods. Um, and then I'll let uh, Mike fill you in on some of the things that happened today. Um, Charlie Blackwell Thompson is back in the launch control center with her team, um, working through some of the next steps that the mission management team asked her to do today. Um, so we launch period 25 is definitely off the table. We won't be launching, uh, you know, this period ends on Tuesday. We will not be launching uh, in this launch period. Um, launch period 26 and 27 will really depend on the options that the team comes back with likely on Monday uh, or early Tuesday morning, and Michael will talk through those options with you. Uh, one thing I'll point out is we will deconflict with Crew 5, so there is an overlap with our uh, next launch period and the time frame when Crew 5 wants to go. We, we need to make sure we deconflict with them. So that will weigh into, uh, into what we do. And then as we get into launch period 27 uh, in the latter part of October, um, we will uh, be looking at a lot of things, our limited life items, um, our stay on the pad durations that we have, and, uh, and of course, we're always looking at, at weather uh, as, a, as a general course of action for some of the storm activity that can be out there. Um, I, I'm sure there's going to be a question of, are we confident? Right? I actually love that question because it's like, are you confident you were going to get out of bed this morning? Um, we're, we're, we don't go into these tests lightly, right? We, we don't just say, hey, we think, we hope this is going to work. Um, the confident, confidence to do another launch attempt today was born out of the fact that uh, we understood the hydrogen leaks that we had on, on Monday. Those are different than the leak that we had today um, in, in terms of scale. One was in the, the same place, but today was a different signature. Um, and we, we understood the engine issue. So we were confident coming into today 
But as the administrator said, we're not going to launch till we're ready, which means we're going to step through these things. Um, there's a lot of conjecture already. Uh, I, I can assure you, I don't know how many people are in that MMT room today, Mike, but I don't know, 100, 100 plus folks, most of them engineers, everybody already thinking about what is the problem. And frankly, that's what happens on the loops when we're, um, when we're talking about these things. Folks are giving options. Uh, the anomaly loops are, are really active, especially on this one today from, from the time we first saw the signature all the way until Charlie made the right decision, which was to scrub. So our confidence comes through what we're going to learn in this. Uh, when we're ready to go back out there, we'll go back out there and try for another uh, launch. Michael will, will lay out for you what we, uh, what we have in, in between. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, obviously, we've talked about this mission being risky, but we're going to take the risks that make sense. Um, the risk that we know that have already pushed the vehicle and the system as far as it will uh, when we launch and, uh, and be ready to go at that time. So with that, let me turn it over to Mike for some more specifics. Okay, and uh, good afternoon again. Thank you for continuing to follow the Artemis One mission in our program. Um, I'll just briefly recap where we uh, left off uh, the last time we were here, which was um, after the uh, Launch Minus Two Mission Management Team meeting on the 1st to review our uh, readiness to head into this launch attempt. If you recall, the uh, Launch Operations Team out of the Launch Control Center stayed in the launch countdown uh, following the uh, attempt on Monday, and that gave us a head start headed into today's attempt. Uh, the, uh, the team, when we came in for the uh, tanking meeting, which was to decide whether or not to load the vehicle with uh, the cryogenic fuel and oxidizer today, was uh, on the timeline or slightly ahead, and uh, it was a clean meeting. Uh, we met at uh, 04.45 uh, this morning, and uh, we talked about our setup for the day, and uh, there were a few, excuse me, uh, there were a few items that we talked about, uh, uh, but most of those were uh, of no particular uh, constraint relative to uh, setting up for our launch attempt. Uh, the team uh, identified that they had 46 collision avoidance cutouts in the in the launch window. Most were a minute uh, or, or uh, I'm sorry, most were just a few seconds. The longest ones were about a minute. Uh, we do have uh, at this particular time of year a uh, high propellant bulk temperature uh, which uh, gives us more performance out of the rocket. So essentially we have a hot rocket in terms of the uh, performance um, to launch and that actually uh, as we fly up through the Earth's atmosphere uh, pushes the uh, higher end of the maximum dynamic pressure or Q bar. And we uh, saw that we had positive margins but uh, lower margins on one specific area on the Orion spacecraft and we were watching that. Uh, the vehicle was expected to get to about 700 pounds per square foot of uh, pressure as it headed up through the, uh, the period of maximum dynamic pressure. Uh, just prior to the uh, cryogenic loading operation, the, the team was working through a chill down, and uh, the, um, there was an inadvertent uh, pressurization of the hydrogen transfer line that the uh, pressure uh, exceeded what we, what we had planned, which was about 20 pounds per square inch. It, it got up to about 60 pounds per square inch. And uh, the flight hardware itself we know is, is fine. Uh, we did not exceed the uh, uh, maximum uh, design pressure, uh, but uh, there's a chance that the, um, that the soft goods or the, uh, the uh, seal in the quick disconnect at the 8-inch uh, quick disconnect um, saw some effects from that. But it's too early to tell exactly uh, whether that was the cause of the, uh, the hydrogen leak that we had today. What we do know is that we saw a large leak at the 8-inch quick disconnect today, and um, that uh, leak started when we went from the slow fill to the fast fill. Uh, this particular quick disconnect did not have a problem uh, of this magnitude on Monday. We did see a small leak, but we did not see one of this magnitude. It was, it was uh, characterized as a large leak by our, by our operations team. Uh, the team tried three times to resolve the leak and all three times we saw a large leak um, and and as was discussed previously if if you can thermally stabilize both sides of that quick disconnect we have a ground side and a flight side and that is where the fluid flow occurs through if you can chill that down and and ensure that there's no differential um, temperature across that interface sometimes the leaks can seal themselves or or heal themselves so the team attempted that 
they attempted to um, essentially reseat the leak by by um, increasing the pressure in there, and and that was uh, was uh, not successful. Uh, so initially, the team uh, declared the scrub at 11:17 Eastern time, and then went into vehicle safing and and drained the cryo. Um, the liquid oxygen is currently off the vehicle, and uh, the liquid hydrogen, at least when we were in the mission management team meeting, was still on board the vehicle, and they were in the process of draining it. It should be off by now or very close to it. The team will get into what they call the inerting, which is they put um, uh, gaseous nitrogen in there uh, so as not to condense uh, water vapor in the, uh, in the tank area, and then uh, they'll, they'll swap over to air. What that does is it allows us to get the the tanks back up to ambient uh, conditions and then for us to gain access. Uh, in the uh, scrub meeting that we had at 2.30 uh, at, uh, Eastern, we talked about three options. The first option was to uh, simply demate and remate the umbilical at the pad, hoping that the uh, soft goods would seal the leak up, but our confidence level given the size of the leak that we saw today was fairly low that that would solve the problem. Uh, the team uh, leaned towards a, um, a uh, removal and replacement of the soft goods in the quick disconnect, and the options were basically to do it at the pad or do it uh, back in the vehicle assembly building. And either of those options do not preserve our ability to fly uh, before the end of this launch period, which expires on the 6th. So uh, the team is developing a series of schedule options, and we're going to hear about those early next week. Uh, the schedule options include uh, removal and replacement of the, um, the soft goods on the, on the quick disconnect at the pad, followed by a uh, cryo test. That is the only place we can get a full cryo test to ensure that we do not have uh, the, uh, a further issue with respect to leaks at the uh, at the temperatures that we need to fill the vehicle on day of launch. Uh, the other option is to roll back and remove and replace the, um, the um, quick disconnect uh, uh, soft goods in the vehicle assembly building. Uh, there's a risk versus risk trade. Doing it at the pad, you're exposed to the environmental conditions, and we need to build an environmental enclosure to do that. If we do it in the vehicle assembly building, the vehicle assembly building is the environmental enclosure. Uh, however, we cannot test this uh, quick disconnect at, in the VAB at cryogenic temperatures. We can only do it at ambient temperatures. So we're, we're working through those options. Uh, the team, uh, it's, it's too early to say, but they're working through a fault tree analysis as to why we did not see a leak of this magnitude on Monday, but we're seeing it um, uh, of, of this magnitude at today's attempt. And uh, they're also looking at the uh, chill down procedure uh, to uh, look at additional uh, controls such that we don't have a reoccurrence of the, uh, of the um, inadvertent overpressure that we had earlier today. So all that said, we've talked about it before. This is an incredibly hard business. This is an initial test flight of this vehicle. As was said by uh, Administrator Nelson, we're going to fly when we're ready. And uh, as part of this initial test flight, we're learning the vehicle. We're learning how to operate the vehicle, and we are learning um, all of the things required to get us ready to fly. And uh, we've demonstrated a large number of those things, uh, not only through wet dress and some of the other uh, ground tests that we've had, but uh, we, we are still learning as we go, again, to get this vehicle off safely. So our focus is on uh, understanding the problem, developing solutions uh, in terms of schedule, but also risk versus risk impacts, and we'll follow up um, next week when we when we have those options uh, fleshed out further. So with that, I'll pass it back to Jackie. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so now we'll open it up for questions in the room and also on the phones. On the phones, as a reminder, press star one to get into the queue. And in the room, if you could leave your hand high for the mic folks to come get you after you ask your question. Uh, first up, Joey Roulette with Reuters. A uh, question for Mike. If you decide to roll back, and I know you know it's uncertain right now, um, what's the quickest you could roll SLS back out to the pad? What would that look like, and what other things would you have to do in the VAB while it's there? We're looking at several weeks to do that, um, depending on the 
required work at the pad or whether we do it in the vehicle assembly building that'll determine the exact the exact schedule but it's it's several weeks of work it's really too early to say exactly how many days thanks and up next on the phones we have Marcia Dunn with the AP yes hi can you hear me we can hear you yes um uh, I was wondering, so are you saying uh, if you do the repairs at the pad and it seems to go well, you could shoot, st still maybe get off in September uh, by the end of the month before the SpaceX uh, launch coming up at the beginning of October? Is that a possibility? And the way things stand right now, um, which way do you think you're leaning for? Thanks. I'll just take the first part of that. Uh, you know, I think we, we still have our uh, constraint on the range with the range to test our flight termination system which is right now we have 25 days you know i think we're going to talk with the range about what the possibilities are but uh we you know in order to to test our batteries change out the batteries we have to we have to roll back uh, for that and i'll let you handle the options so. yeah and and marcia with respect to uh whether or not September, um, the, the latter part of September is still in the trade space. I, again, I think it's too early to tell. It really comes down to what, is, what does the fault tree analysis tell us and what are the uh, necessary changes and mitigations required uh, in, order to, um, in order to have a confidence that we've resolved this large leak at the 8-inch quick disconnect. So I, I, I think we'll have a much better answer early next week, and right now it's just too early to tell. Thank you. Next, we have Tom Costello with NBC. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Can I just clarify, you said that the, uh, the line had been overpressurized up to 60 PSI. Do you believe that that overpressurization potentially caused the leak that then you were dealing with all day today? And any idea how that line was overpressurized? Yeah, I, I guess what, what I'd say is I think Mike talked about the fault tree. Uh, we, we have to go look at, is that a cause? Is that the cause? It, I'm sure it'll end up on the fault tree, but we have to run through all legs of that fault tree before we decide that's absolutely um, absolutely the cause. Um, we, we do, I think, I, I forget how the words that you used uh, last one, we kind of tune in this, this hydrogen. We, we did that on Monday. You know, Monday we saw it, it start to go up and we, we slowed the rate and did a manual fill. Um, that's just part of the process, and, and we, we need to look, as Mike said, to, to automate that um, and, and get the places where it, it'll cut out if, if the pressure is, is going too high so we don't, we don't hit that kind of command again. Um, that'll be part of what we, we automate and, and practice for the, for the next time. But it's on the fault tree. Um, it's kind of tough to say right now, yeah, that is the absolute cause. Chris Davenport, Washington Post. Thank you. I, I just want to clarify, you're going back to the VAB no matter what, right? I just want to clarify that. And I wonder if you could just briefly, Mike, talk about the differences with this uh, hydrogen leak, this big one that you had versus the one that you were able to overcome on Monday. Thanks. Yeah, for the VAB part of it, it's, it's what I said. We, we have to go back right now. We don't, do not have an agreement with the range that we can launch when our batteries have not been tested after 25 days. Um, so that, that runs out here, as Mike said. Um, and so in order to change them out, we have to go back. Um, to get that kind of extension with the range is something we'd have to talk to them about. So right now our position is we will have to go back to the VAB. Um, when we go back will depend on the testing options that Mike talked about. Yeah, and, and to take a crack at the second part of your uh, question there, um, Chris, um, in terms of the leak that we saw on Monday, it, w it was a manageable leak. Uh, this was not a manageable leak. It, it, as soon as we started uh, to get in the fast fill, and, and we need to get in the fast fill, again, as part of this delicate balance of you want to, um, <laughs> you, you want to load uh, within, the, within the capability of the quick disconnect, uh, which tells you you want to slow it down, but you also want to speed it up so you can make your launch window. So you've got this balance between the um, between the the flow rate and the pressure, and if there's a leak present, you need to manage that. So 
on Monday, the team was able to successfully work their way through that while staying with below the, the hazardous concentration limit of the uh, hydrogen that was leaking out. We were unable to do that today. It was a much larger leak. The team tried to work and use the same technique as part of a, a pre-planned procedure. Um, they tried multiple times, and, and that didn't work. In addition to trying to, uh, to bump the, uh, the quick disconnect, and try to reseed it, and, and none, none of those techniques worked. Um, the techniques that we used on Monday just for this uh, magnitude of leak were, were, were not working in our favor. Thanks, Mike. Kristen Fisher with CNN. Thank you. Uh, just wondering if there is a precedent uh, for getting an extension with the range on something like this. Has that ever been done before? Or uh, if you all were to ask the range for that to allow the, the vehicle to stay on the launch pad before a next attempt, would that be something that's, that hasn't been done before? I think we, we, we work with them just recently to go from 20 to 25 days, uh, showing them a lot of the technical data that they needed to see about uh, the integrity of our system. So I'm, I'm confident there's probably been other ones. I can't quote the history, but I can tell you that we just negotiated with them to go from 20 to 25. Do you, think, do you feel at least somewhat confident that there's a chance um, that perhaps this rocket could stay on the pad before a next launch attempt? Um, well, that, that's, I mean, my, my conjecture is I don't know because uh, it's, it's, really, it's really their call. And I think we have data that probably supports it, and I know, I know our folks are going to go talk to the range as soon as they're able to, but that's really, uh, you know, that's serious business that they deal with and we deal with, and we want to respect that this is their range and we're launching from it. Lauren Grush with Bloomberg. Hi, Lauren Grush with Bloomberg. I'm wondering if you can walk us through exactly what hardware you need to be replacing exactly where it is and how time intensive that work will be. Thanks. Yeah, Lawrence, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, right now we're focused on the 8-inch the quick disconnect and simply the, the uh, soft goods, the, the seal that surrounds it. Um, we need to get through the fault tree analysis to figure out exactly uh, if, there's, if there's anything else that needs to be accounted for. It's a little too early to tell, again, um, as to what uh, else may be in play, what other work uh, may be necessary. So there's there's the kind of your your engineering review board or or technical analysis that will happen in the office environment, and then we'll go out and we'll demate the umbilical, whether it's at the pad or in the vehicle assembly building, depending on um, what the what the team brings forward next week, and we'll we'll put those two together and decide what are the things that we can resolve based on the data that we already have from the fault tree analysis and say we don't need to check these things or we absolutely need to check these things. And then uh, we will also have uh, some witness information when we, when we demate the umbilical. We're being very thoughtful about demating the umbilical at this point because we also don't want to disturb what may be um, critical engineering data is part of that. So before we we proceed into um, a, a simple, what we think may be a simple removal and replacement of this quick disconnect seal, we want to make sure that we're not overlooking something. So we're going to take some time to go through this from a from an engineering standpoint, go through any potential cause or exclude any potential cause based on the information we had. So it's again, it's a little too early to tell exactly where um, where we may need to do some work. Thank you. Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Uh, two quick ones about the, the hydrogen. First of all, um, maybe Mike, if I was staying there with a bucket and some cryogenic proof gloves, like how quickly would it fill the bucket? Just want to sort of get a sense of the magnitude of the leak. You've, you've called it a large leak. And then for Senator Nelson, you know, when you were writing the authorization bill in 2010, sort of setting up this base launch system, did you have concerns about the continued use of hydrogen due to its leaky nature and, and your experience with it on shuttle? Thanks. Well, I'll answer that right out. Uh, I, and along with Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson, along with uh, our folks in the White House, uh, deferred to the people who best knew 
the systems. And so the answer to your question is no. We did not have uh, any question about hydrogen. We deferred to the experts. Yeah, and Eric, to answer your, your question about how large is the leak, um, I, I, I wouldn't use a bucket analogy on that one. It, it really is a concentration. Um, you know, when, when you have a fuel source in atmospheric air that contains roughly 20% oxygen, when you mix the two, all you need is an, ign an ignition source to uh, close the fire triangle. So we know that when you get above roughly a 4% concentration of, of hydrogen, in ambient air, you're at risk of having a, a flammability um, uh, event or a, a flammability hazard. Uh, we were seeing in excess of that uh, by uh, probably two or three orders of magnitude today. So um, I'm sorry, not orders of magnitude, two, two or three times our, our acceptable concentration limit. Um, so it was pretty clear that we weren't going to be able to work our way through it like we did on Monday in terms of the uh, the managing of the leak uh, every every time we saw the leak it w it was a large leak that immediately exceeded our flammability uh, limits so um, you know again a couple of techniques uh, were tried and, and we just couldn't get there today Tariq with space.com uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com uh, from Mike. Uh, just to follow up on Lauren's question about the nature of what has to be replaced, you mentioned soft goods. Is that as simple as just a, a rubber seal? Is it silicone, uh, or is it more hardware that you do have to, to replace? And and why would you need a an enclosure around it? Is it just to prevent corrosion then on that seal? Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the quick disconnect. It's it is a um, it's a, a metal um, poppet like device, and it has a gasket around it. And I, d I don't know the exact um, gasket material, um, but if if we were to see damage on the quick disconnect, that would tell us we would need to replace the hardware. Uh, if we saw foreign object debris, that would tell us that maybe we got something else going on. Or if we just saw a simple damage on the gasket, we've got spares, we can quickly remove and replace that. Our history uh, of our own testing at the Launch Equipment Test Facility, which is, which is right here resident at the uh, Kennedy Space Center, tells us that a leak of this magnitude is typically resolved through a removal and replacement of the, of the soft goods, that seal. And, and that's kind of one of our leading suspects right now. Um, but again, we, we need to go through the fault tree. We need to inspect the hardware. We need to see what the hardware is telling us. So in terms of exactly what needs to be done, it's, it's too early to tell. And I'm, I'm sorry, there was a second part to your question. I don't recall what the second part was. About the enclosure. About, oh, uh, the, enc the enclosure, yeah. So. Uh, the enclosure affords us uh, the ability to uh, provide what we call a purge at that interface. And the purge allows us to push uh, nitrogen in there to essentially inert or push out any oxygen in there. So it reduces the likelihood of a, uh, a flammability hazard. So if we were to just pump regular old air in there, regular old air has oxygen in it. and, and we eliminate that oxygen by creating an enclosure and, and putting nitrogen there in there to displace any oxygen such that if there is a hydrogen leak, you've got one leg of the, the fire triangle removed. Thanks. Now we'll go to a question from the phones. We have Ramin Skiba from Wired. Hi, thank you. Um, this is a question I think for Mike. Um, I was wondering what are the risks to the, the CubeSat secondary missions, if, if there's a significant delay, like is, is that a factor in determining um, the, the, the launch date, um, you know, if, if, if some, some of them cannot be recharged, if the batteries cannot be recharged? Yeah, that's a good question, Ramin. Um, we do maintain a um, open communication loop with the, uh, with the CubeSat customers, so we will certainly inform them that uh, we, we did not um, 
uh, have our our uh, our uh, launch attempt today, and and what our next uh, our next uh, launch attempt looks like from a schedule standpoint, and we'll make a risk based decision. Um, based on a whole host of factors, uh, you know, if we do need to roll back to the vehicle assembly building, we could top off uh, the uh, batteries for a number of those, or they may not even need to be topped off based on uh, what we what we believe to be the known um, battery decay rate and battery state of charge. Um, I I personally haven't seen all that data, um, but it it is part of the process of of looking at a given uh, uh, launch period. And, and we will uh, share that information with our CubeSat providers and then decide what the appropriate next steps are. Um, whether or not any of those uh, are at risk at this point, it's, it's, it, I don't have the data in front, in front of me to answer that question. Thanks, Mike. Micah Maidenberg with Wall Street Journal. You put your hand. Uh, Mike and Maidenberg, Wall Street Journal. Just back to the inadvertent pressurization, that was three times the amount of pressure that was planned for. Could you walk us through sort of what led up to that, and have, have you seen that before in practice runs or at the testing facility? Thanks. So um, we're, still, we're still reviewing um, the, the data and the sequence of events, but as, as I understand it, it occurred during the, uh, the chill down prior to the to the uh, loading operation associated with uh, loading the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And uh, it was part of the, the preparatory steps. And uh, there was a, a sequence of about a dozen commands that were required. And it was uh, simply the wrong valve was commanded. And it was, it was identified um, uh, after about three or four seconds. And then it was rectified. So. That's, that's what we understand. We know what the pressure profile looked like at, at this particular interface. And um, we're, we're looking at, uh, again, the, the sequence. And, and as was mentioned by our, um, our uh, lead project engineer earlier today, um, you know, we, want, we want to be deliberate and careful about, about um, drawing conclusions here because correlation does not equal causation. So we, we, are, we are taking a look at the inadvertent overpress, and we're looking at what that meant to this particular uh, interface, and then we're looking at the fault tree associated with the um, the uh, leak that we saw, and if there is uh, a a conjunction of of potential uh, causes on the fault tree, then then we'll that'll take us down one path. Um, if there is no, um, you know, uh, root cause that you can trace to that. Then, then that'll take us down a different path. So, again, it's a little early to tell. We've we've looked through um, quite a bit of information already, but we got to work our way through this one, and we're going to do it methodically. Jeff Faust with Space News. <clears throat> Jeff Faust with Space News. Um, if the eastern range allows you to extend the life of the FTS and you're able to do the uh, repairs on the pad, are there any other factors that would allow you to stay there and not have to roll back? I, I think what I said earlier is we have to look at our stay at the pad because there's um, some, for Orion at the crew and service module, there's some constraints at how much time they can spend at the pad versus the winds. Um, so we, we have to look at that, and if we're within that, that would be uh, something we'd look at as a, as a plus side if we can stay within that analysis. Um, but I think ultimately we're driven by the FTS. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Mike. Yeah. Um, we, need to, we need to look at what, exactly, what work exactly we need to do, and, and there may be um, – Depending on on the, the fault tree analysis and, and any inspection work that we do, it may mean that the vehicle assembly building is the right place to go do this work. Um, we are mindful that uh, we're out there in the elements when we're at the pad. Um, that has a a couple of of pros and cons associated with it. Um, you know, the cons happen pretty much every afternoon around here when you get a shower or a thunderstorm rolling through, and we don't want to. We don't want to, um, you know, have, uh, 
you know, issues with that interface because we demated it out there in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the environment. So we're we're going to talk through all those things. I, I think it's again a little bit early to say as to what the right path forward is. Uh, flight termination system is certainly one variable that we've got to consider as part of all this. And as Jim said earlier, the range has has and the Space Force have been fantastic partners working with us as part of uh, our government and interagency work. Um, we don't own that decision. The range owns that decision. Uh, so uh, we would have to, to work with them and talk to them before any decisions are made. Marina Corrin with The Atlantic. Thank you. Hi, Marina Corrin with The Atlantic. Are you at all considering doing another wet dress rehearsal after you've implemented some repairs instead of going right into another launch attempt. Uh, the administrator said earlier, we're not going to launch until it's right. So in order to get to that point, is there anything that would make you say, okay, let's go back, we're going to test until it's right? Thank you. Yeah, I guess what I'd say is uh, you know, whatever this, the connection that we, we're we testing under, under ambient is going to be acts a lot different than cryogens. We've tested this one in our wet dress rehearsal four, this sealed at four. Uh, we saw it manageable the other day, so to us, you know, it, it's uh, we, hydrogen is difficult to work with. I think Mike characterized that a couple of press conferences ago. Um, so from our perspective, we, we may look at in these options when we stay at the pad, if we change it at the pad, do we do that cryogenic test there? Um, and what that cryogenic test consists of is, is TBD. That's what the team will come up with. Um, but from my perspective, we tested this at a wet dress. So to say, hey, we should have done another wet dress, this one, this one sealed at the wet dress. Um, you know, I will take everybody back. I think it, uh, I, the summer of 1990 was the summer of hydrogen where shuttle had been launching for nine years. And they spent a whole summer chasing hydrogen leaks. So um, I'm, I'm not saying that's an excuse. That's just a fact. Um, and we've seen a couple different hydrogen leaks. I think we're trying to dial this vehicle in. Um, whatever this fault was, we have to find out, and we will run it to ground and build that confidence that I talked about earlier to come out there again. If if the team says, hey, a wet dress is the way to go, then we need to figure that out. Um, but right now, from my perspective, we've tested this. It's worked a couple times, and it didn't today. We'll figure out the reason why. And the only thing I would add is, we know we don't need to do a full wet dress rehearsal if we were to um, test out this interface. We, for example, we don't need to load the interim, interim cryopropulsion stage or the upper stage. We, we know that those interfaces are fine. So if, if we were to do a, a cryo test at this particular interface after some work is done at the pad, um, we don't need to do a full up wet dress rehearsal, if that makes sense. Next up, we have another question on the phones. David Curley with Discovery. Um, Serafin, you talked about um, it being inadvertent. Was that software that caused the overpressurization? And is that something you've not seen other times when you were doing the pre-chill? And I take it from your earlier answer, soft goods uh, that you're considering that the overpressurization may have affected our gaskets, O-rings, anything that's pliable. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the first part of that question, uh, the inadvertent command uh, the, um, and overpress, um, again, it's, it's a little bit early to tell exactly what happened. Uh, we're still working our way through it, but what we do know that this was a manual sequence, and uh, it, it may have been um, the fact that we didn't automate this particular sequence um, that could have been part of the part of the um, reason that we had the uh, the uh, inadvertent overpressure. There are a whole host of other reasons that um, you know when when you're an operator and and you're working through oper uh, a command sequence that could have also come into play. So we're just going to take time to look through it. We're going to look through the data, and and we will we will um, go back and reassess exactly why this inadvertent command happened. In terms of soft goods, yes, it's, it's basically a, a seal um, that is that is a non-metallic non material. I, I don't remember what the, the particular material is, um, but yes, that that's what we mean, or what I mean when I say soft goods. Thanks, Mike. Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. 
Thanks. Um, I think this is probably for Mike. Um, there was uh, some time between uh, the recommendation to scrub and when Charlie decided to call it a day. Um, was there additional troubleshooting that was being discussed as an uh, as an option? Is there anything else that um, was gleaned uh, from the activities that took place today? And then separately, is the sensor issue that we were here talking about a couple of days ago. Is that a factor at all in any of these scenarios? Thanks. Uh, I'll start with your last question. Uh, the short answer is no. The sensor issue that we saw the other day, it's, uh, that is on the engine side uh, as part of the engine bleed that's used to thermally condition the engines. No, it, it, as far as replacing it or doing something to address it during this time. Oh, um, no, that, that really hasn't entered into the, into the discussion. Um, in terms of additional troubleshooting, uh, there was a pause uh, before a scrub was declared just to ensure that we had exhausted all of our options and and we had um, some discussions come from our from our engineering team as to what a potential um, option may be and it and it turned out to not not be a viable option so there were there were some ongoing discussions to ensure that um, we had really exhausted all of our options and and that's why there was a little bit of a pause towards the end before the scrub was declared here in the second row. Hi, my name is Jacob Sedesi. I'm a student tech reporter at WUFT News out of the University of Florida. I have two questions. Uh, one, so I know I heard earlier that uh, the temperature affects how the rocket launch goes in some ways. So as summer goes into fall, goes into winter, how is this mission going to need to be adapted um, going forward this far into the future? And second of all, I know it's one you're not going to want to hear right now, but I want to ask it anyway. Um, how does this pushback affect the timeline of the Artemis program as a whole? I'll take the second one. Uh, we are still planning uh, Artemis II in 2024 and Artemis III in 25. Okay. And then in terms of temperature effects, uh, because we have a combination of, of solid propellant in the boosters and liquid propellant in the core stage. The uh, core stage really has no significant impact uh, due to temperature other than uh, what we call the boil off, which is um, you um, cause the, the propellant to go from a liquid to a gas and, and you're not able to feed the engines um, as part of that. Uh, that is, there's essentially no effect associated with that um, because it, it, as, the, as, the, uh, as we go from summer into the fall months um, because you load the cryo and then you go and, and you ensure that the tank is full before you go. In terms of the solid uh, uh, propulsion system, uh, the lower the bulk temperature of the propellant, the lower the performance you get and we know what the performance characteristics of this, these particular boosters are and they've been tested throughout the full range. Um, the, uh, the, the summer months, you get the most performance out of the solids, and the performance will be slightly lower in the fall. Uh, but when we looked at our performance numbers, they were eye-watering in terms of margin to our insertion altitude uh, that we were planning. So uh, we're not particularly concerned with, with performance of the rocket at this point. In the back here, behind Joey. Thank you. Manuel Masanti from Debate. Um, given these two cancellations and further delays, I would like to know how this affects the other payload on board, like the 10 CubeSats that we have. Is there any reason that we need change battery changes or how these affect the, 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 cube, the CubeSats? Thank you. I, I think we answered the, uh, the CubeSat question earlier. Um, we know that we have uh, limited battery life on the CubeSats and, and we understand what the decay rate is. Uh, the customers of the CubeSats uh, have been made aware of, of uh, what our um, access is uh, before the CubeSats were ever loaded. Uh, we also have payloads inside the Orion capsule, uh, things like radiation monitors and, and a number of other things. And uh, we know uh, what the, the installed or baseline configuration was. Obviously, the longer you sit out there on the pad, the, the more uh, radiation some of these sensors will accrue. But we also have witness uh, sensors in there to help us understand uh, what, what we accumulated during the spaceflight portion as opposed to here on the ground. So 
uh, you know, there there are a whole host of, of things that we that we plan ahead and track. And at this point, you know, that we're we're really focused on uh, getting the vehicle ready, uh, and we're uh, we understand what the uh, potential impacts are to the payloads and and the cube sets, whether they're uh, in Orion or or on the Space Launch System rocket as part of the ten cube sets. So, um, I, yeah, I I think I think we've talked that. So here in the second row. From WUFT at the University of Florida. Uh, my question is uh, for the senator. Uh, we understand that you know you're not going until you're ready, and it is, and that it's right. Um, and we know that scrubs are a very natural part of all of the space missions. Uh, that said, I gotta believe that there's some level of disappointment. Can you describe the demeanor inside the LCC, and specifically, how's um, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, not, and and what did you say to her today? Um, you know, after the decision to scrub. The demeanor in the LCC is very professional. They do their job naturally. All of us, no, no more than then all of us, including the LCC, uh, wanted it to go today. Uh, but we also, and these guys that are the professionals know, it doesn't go until it's ready. Any words, any, anything, um, did you share any private moments with Charlie, how's she ha holding up, anybody? Any comments to, you know, uh, Keep her and her team uh, motive. I mean, everybody's motivated. But any other comments that you can share? I will say this before Mike answers that: uh, this team is very aware of potential fatigue, and therefore uh, they gave sufficient time off for the team uh, yesterday after the MMT, uh, which occurred, uh, I think, two days ago. L minus two. Uh, they gave everybody the day off so they could regroup and, and rest. Uh, and that's uh, part of the lessons that came out of the Challenger report. Fatigue was a factor there. Mike? Yeah, yeah in terms of the firing room and, and Charlie in particular, uh, you know, one of the things that's um, one, of the th one of the things that I particularly enjoy about the agency is you surround yourself with amazingly capable people and, and some amazing leadership. And Charlie is certainly one of those amazing leaders that we have in the agency. Uh, when I uh, was talking to her about the scrub decision, she was focused, head in the game. She was, uh, you know, focused on the operation and the flight hardware and uh, safing the vehicle and ensuring that her team had what they need, had what they needed. Uh, to uh, to get through the remaining operation, and uh, you know, it, it, there's that's that's kind of natural when you come from the operations realm. Uh, you know, there's there's definitely time to reflect uh, on that after you come out of the firing room on the drive home or or once you're home. But um, that was neither the time nor the place, and she didn't show any inkling that she was focused on anything other than uh, the right decisions for her team and for the for the spacecraft and for the rocket. Thank you. Marcia Smith, the Space Policy Online. Marcia Smith, spacepolicyonline.com. Uh, Jim and Mike, I know you've both discussed this already a couple times, but I'm still unclear about the decision as to whether or not you're gonna roll back. Jim, I heard you say you must roll back because of the FTS batteries. Mike, I heard you say if you roll back, then you might be able to recharge the CubeSats. You talked about how you might have several, you think you have several weeks of work. So if you were to go to the range and ask them to give you another waiver for the STS, it's not just a couple days, it's several weeks. So can you just sort of condense it all and, and, and concisely say, are you rolling back or not? Or when will you make a decision? And is the FTS battery the only thing that stands in your way of rolling back or not? We don't have an FTS waiver right now beyond 25 days. So until we have that, we have to roll back in order to, to satisfy the range requirement. We, I said we'll work with the range to, to, to try and get that, but we have to decide what it is, what the duration we want based on the launch period availability we have. 
and what they're willing to give us. So that negotiation hasn't happened. So as far as I'm concerned, we have to roll back because we have to satisfy that requirement. Um, that's where I think Mike's if statement comes from because we, we, that is a possibility, but we don't have that today. And I'll just be upfront with you. I don't always pick the best words, right? And, and, <laughs> and I, I could have chosen a better phrase or a better, better word in that case. And, and Jim is absolutely right. It is, it is not our decision. It is the range's decision. They're the ones responsible for managing public safety. So um, when we roll back, unless we get a waiver, it's, it's, it is a rollback scenario. So um, I, I said if, and I apologize for that. I probably could have chosen better words. Um, if that's the hardest thing I had to deal with today, then, I, then I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about that. So Here in the back. Good afternoon, Liz Hurley, WAFF Huntsville. My question can be for any or all of you all. Can you talk to me about actual costs of two back-to-back -back scrubs? And do you feel there's a cost to public perception? There was so much buildup to this launch. So many people came to Florida to spend a week hoping they'd get to see a moon rocket fly. Is there something that you are looking at now regarding the public? Uh, you all talk about the back-to-back -back cost, and I'll talk about the perception. Uh, <laughs> you know, space is the place. Everybody is really interested in this mission and going back to Mars and getting ready to go, uh, going back to the moon and getting ready to go to Mars. Uh, one of the things that we did early on was we tried to stress that this is a test. And a test has certain risk. And uh, we pounded that in every public comment that we had in order to get expectations in alignment with reality. Uh, and yet human nature is what you know it is. Uh, people are ready. Uh, you saw the crowds out here on Monday morning. Uh, a lot less crowds today. Uh, however, uh, the nature of humans is that uh, we want to see it and participate in it. And, uh, and yet, Despite all that, that's why these guys are such consummate professionals. They do it by the book and when it's ready. And as far as cost, I mean, I, I, I can't give you a number. I can tell you the cost, it, there's commodities we use with oxygen and hydrogen. We do try and recover some of those as we drain back into our supply tanks, but a lot of those cryogens boil off, so we have to have them topped off. I, I forget how many tankers we had uh, after Monday's attempt uh, exactly. I think uh, we had like five or six waves, as remember uh, uh, Charlie talking about. But the exact cost of that oxygen, hydrogen, I, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't tell you that off the top of my head. You know, it's, I, I go to commodities first. Um, and uh, and obviously, you know, we, we schedule up resources to, to provide the common tracking for, for us um, and then the, the labor of the folks here, but the fo that, that labor folks are working on anyway. But so it's probably some of the assets that aren't ours that are outside of NASA's control and the liquid oxygen and hydrogen. But I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you one, a number off the top of my head. The cost of two scrubs is a lot less than a failure. Michael Grushko with Nagio. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is for the administrator. Um, we are coming up on the 60th anniversary of President Kennedy's famous Rice University speech in which he declared that we choose to go to the moon. Um, nearly 60 years later, how do you reflect on the upcoming anniversary and the challenges that we face as we choose once again to go to the moon. Thanks. 
As a matter of fact, uh, on the 60th anniversary, I will be in Rice Stadium. Uh, there will be uh, 4,000 uh, public school students that will be in the stadium, just as it was 60 years ago with public school students. And what uh, President Kennedy said was, we choose to go to the moon and do other things, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. This is a whole new vehicle, a whole new technology, a whole new purpose of going back to the moon and preparation to go to Mars. And yes, it's hard. On the phones, we have Ken Chang from the New York Times. Hi, thank you. Um, you've all talked about that you're not going to launch until you're ready. I was just wondering, have you felt any pressure from anywhere, anywhere within NASA, from the White House, from anyone in Congress? Have you felt pressure from anyone at NASA, the White House, or in Congress? Well, I can tell you from my standpoint, no. And if I knew about it, I would try to stop it. Uh, but uh, we have felt no pressure whatsoever. I, I would agree with that, Ken. I, we're, we're not feeling external pressure on any of this. Uh, this is something that um, is his administrator Nelson said, you know, we're really focused on getting off and getting off safely because of the consequences of failure. So I, we're not feeling any pressure externally. So we're running up on the end of our hour. So we have time for one more question. Uh, Ken Kramer. Hi, thank you. Ken Kramer for Space Up Close. Let me ask uh, Mike Serafine a question. A couple, you talked a question, few questions back about the possibility to do cryo-loading to test that seal. I'm wondering how much cryos would you have to load to test the seal if, it, if it's seated? And, and what would be then the turnaround for a launch? So, uh, in terms of how much cryo we would have to load, it, what we would really only need to do is get through the um, uh, chill down, slow fill, and into the fast fill. And, and typically, when you get in the fast fill, if there's going to be a leak, that's where you're going to see it because you have the highest flow rate and the highest pressure, you don't need to fill the whole tank to do that. So, um, you know, it's it would be somewhere, you know, five plus percent. It's it's not a significant amount of the of the liquid hydrogen tank. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? I've been up since midnight, so I'm a little, what's that? How long would you could you turn around for a launch then? Would it be like two or three days later? Again, it, it depends on a whole host of things, um, but you know, in terms of replenishing the commodities and and setting up for a, a subsequent attempt, uh, we, we know that we can turn around either 42, I'm sorry, 48 or 72 hours, um, simply based on commodity and replenishment. Um, if if there were additional engineering um, investigations or additional work that we needed to do uh, following a a cryo test at that interface, um, it is something that. It would have to be factored in the plan. We're, we're going we're gonna to understand this better next week, but um, yeah, in terms of the, the first part of that question, it's, it's not a significant amount of the crowd compared to the, the full load of the tank. Thanks, Mike. As we said earlier, we'll have an update for you next week on the path forward. And as always, turn in, tune into NASA TV and our social media channels to keep up to date on the latest. Thank you all for joining us, and have a great Labor Day. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects.